On 12th of June, Russia celebrates its national day, Russia Day. This is a day that is marked with concerts and celebrations in all the regions in Russian Federation. This year, alongside celebrations from Moscow, Novgorod and Buratia, and other Russian regions, the news on Russian state-owned TV channel Russia One showed images from Kherson region, a Ukrainian territory annexed by Russia in September 2022. In the clip, teenagers were making cookies glazed in the three colors of Russian flag. According to the voiceover, these cookies were to be given to participants in the special operation in Ukraine, a euphemism for Russia's war on Ukraine. What do uh, depictions of occupied regions tell us about nationalism in Russia today? And what nationalist practices have been triggered by the war on the Ukrainian side? These are some of the questions that will be discussed in this podcast. You are listening to an episode of The World Stage, a global politics podcast from the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, NUPI, produced as part of the Rusnet project. I am Natalia Moon Senior Research Fellow at NUPI, and I am sitting here with Paul Good, Macmillan Chair in Russian Studies and Associate Professor at Carlsen University, and Marte Hondomure, Senior Researchers at Norwegian Institute for Urban and Regional, Regional Research. One common way of defining a nation in social sciences stems from Benedict Anderson, who saw the nation as an imagined community. It is imagined because one can never meet everyone who belongs to one's nation. And yet one has an idea of what this community is and feels a song, sense of belonging to it. Paul, you have worked extensively on banal and everyday nationalism and patriotism in Russia. Can we just start with a short definition of these concepts? Yeah, so take a step back for a second. When we talk about nationalism, right, what do we usually mean just by nationalism in and of itself? Typically, we understand nationalism in the sense that was defined by Ernest Gellner, um, I'm paraphrasing here, as the sentiment that's aroused when the boundaries of state and nation are misaligned. And usually nationalism is something which is associated with mobilization, protest, you know, political action. But nationalism isn't always mobilized. Right? It's something that we experience in our everyday life. Um, so in, in quoting Benedict Anderson there, you, know, you drew attention to the fact that it's something which is constantly present in the way that we assume that there is a, a nation of people that are, in principle, they're all knowable, right? They are all people with whom we could sit down and have lunch or do a podcast. Um, how does the state create that image of a nation? How do we get to that position where the nation is a banal reality? Um, that's where, in a sense, my research has started, um, working, building on the work of people like Michael Billig, who began theorizing about uh, banal nationalism, in which national, nationalism is not constantly mobilized, but instead it is pervasive and unnoticed. It's kind of background noise, but it's background noise that configures the ways that we apprehend the world around us. Related to that is what we call everyday nationalism. The two are often conflated because they're very, you know, they, they share a common context, which is routine, everyday life. But everyday nationalism differs somewhat from banal nationalism insofar as it focuses on the ordinary things that ordinary people do with the nation in their day-to-day -day lives and their day-to-day -day interactions. Um, so different things of what we call social practices, the ways that people invoke the nation when they're just having ordinary conversations, the ways that they think about the nation when they're choosing what to buy from the grocery market, um, or the ways that they make choices based upon nationality um, when they're choosing things like was this, documents, books, readings, maybe what to watch on Netflix, what have you. Um, these are all count potentially as the kinds of practices by which national identities are reproduced or challenged or confirmed in everyday life. So in a way, uh, you're saying that uh, the nation is created not only by the state, but it's challenged and uh, in a way created by ordinary people who belong to this nation? That's right. And, and so far as, you know, we often tend to think about nationalism as a top-down phenomenon, right? Something that elites make nationalist claims and people respond by waving flags and protests or marching or what have you. But actually, those nationalist claims don't have any resonance if they don't make sense to people 
with what they do in their day-to-day -day lives. So yes, individuals have agency in the ways that they continually produce the nation from below. And it's that ongoing production of the nation from below that makes it possible ultimately then for elites to mobilize the nation uh, along those shared sen sentiments that are cultivated through everyday practices. Can you maybe give us some examples of these practices mm. from your research? So one of the things that I looked at uh, back in, um, uh, this is back, uh, feels like almost a decade ago now, uh, when I was doing field work in Russia on, on everyday nationalism, was looking at the kinds of things that people would associate with what it means to be a patriot um, in Russia. And very often what this meant was not the kinds of things one would expect. If you look at the, the kinds of things that, the, that Putin was talking about, that um, uh, Minister of Education would talk about, being a patriot would have meant something like, you know, being ready to defend the motherland. Um, and instead what we found is that on an everyday level, people associated their national identity with everyday ordinary things like raising their children right, uh, with making sure that people learned uh, Russian literature um, and appreciation for history, um, and or even in a basic sense, doing things that they considered to be important in a social level in terms of like picking up uh, or uh, cleaning up around their apartment buildings. Um, and in this sense, what people would do in their day-to-day -day lives were things that were meaningful because they related to ultimately their notion of what they considered to be a way of loving the motherland. You find mm -hmm. that Russia is different in this respect than other countries uh, in, in um, so identifying mm -hmm. exactly these practices uh, as uh, their everyday patriotism or... Yeah, so the, the, so the way that I tend to think about nations um, and con sort of in accordance with this notion of everyday nationalism is, you know, typically we think about nations as groups. We think about groups of people. Uh, from an everyday nationalist perspective, we think about nations as collections of practices. Those practices might overlap. And in, some, in a very abstract level, we can say that everyday nationalism kind of works the same way in all countries. You know, so everybody has different ways of talking with the nation, talking about the nation, performing the nation, consuming the nation. But the very distinctive ways that people orient those practices towards their own state and towards their own nation do vary. Um, and so in that sense, you would expect that First of all, yes, there would be distinctive ways that Russians perform the nation, that Russians talk about the nation, that they consume the nation, even though they bear a resemblance to the ways that other people do the same. Um, so it's not just sort of like a cookie cutter approach to nationalism, um, but it is one in which people will make cookie cutters in the shape of Russia and consume the nation in that fashion. Marta, you've been working on Ukraine and Ukrainians. Do you have any examples uh, of everyday nationalism that, that could be typical for Ukrainians? Well, uh, then I think we have to talk about uh, the specific situation in which uh, we are in now uh, with the Russian war uh, on Ukraine and uh, and um, perhaps everyday nationalist practices uh, in unsettled times, mm. to, to borrow uh, Paul's term. Uh, um, and in, in a way, um, I think we can argue that unsettled times, they did not start in 2022. Unsettled times uh, has been ongoing, I don't know, uh, at least since 2014 with the Euromaidan and uh, um, annexation of Crimea. And, and uh, what we know about the Ukrainian context is that the Russian aggression has uh, helped consolidate Ukraine in a way. So um, the Ukrainian identity among people has been strengthened as a response to the, the Russian aggression. Uh, and this has, uh, uh, um, well, it's evident in, in many different ways, but, but uh, at least, um, uh, well, I don't know how, how familiar uh, our listeners are with the Ukrainian context, but Ukraine as well has uh, been a multi-ethnic state. Uh, people have been is using different languages, although Ukrainian has been the state language since uh, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. 
and uh, and um, linguistic practices of um, of people, especially former Russian-speaking Ukrainian uh, Ukrainians, has been changing since 2014. Uh, and. Uh, uh, ordinary people, but also also authors that uh, formerly used to be part of a, a, a Russian literary sphere, uh, they have switched uh, to to write in uh, in Ukrainian. Um, and what we see now after the full-scale invasion in 2022 is that this process have, has accelerated even further. Uh, so people are making personal choices to to switch from their what we would say their native tongue <laughs> uh, until uh, Ukrainian. And what is interesting is that this this term um, native tongue in, in Ukrainian they will use uh, not only about the language that they uh, used to speak with their parents from childhood on. They will also they have also embraced Ukrainian as their native language so if you are if you, you want to really know what they are speaking you cannot ask about native language anymore in in, in the ukrainian context because they will maybe have two uh, native languages or they would say ukrainian because it's the state language <laughs> uh, whereas they perhaps grew up in a russian-speaking family well this is actually very interesting um also because uh the language uh issue is one of the issues mentioned uh, by Putin uh, and uh, to legitimize uh, the inv invasion of Ukraine because Russian language, Russian speakers were being repressed, right? Uh, but what you're actually saying that this is also like a choice, everyday choice that Ukrainians are making for themselves, that they are switching language, right? Absolutely, and uh, uh, we conducted uh, research uh, in Ukraine in 2019 uh, um, in Ukrainian schools because there was this uh, new reform in Ukraine uh, which um, limited um, the amount of teaching that was allowed in uh, other languages that, than Ukrainian within the Ukrainian school. And we we expected, uh, coming from Norway, uh, um, a lot of uh, protest, or I personally expected more protest with regard to this reform, but it turned out that this process is, was going on bottom up already uh, <laughs> for many years. <laughs> so, so this legislation was, uh, although to some it was, uh, it was uh, uh, perceived as problematic, uh, many people had uh, chosen Ukrainian um, as a language for their children prior to this piece of uh, legislation entering into force. Hmm. Paul, uh just to bring you back in and stay with Ukraine, but with the annexed territories, you have done research on on how uh, these territories are represented on Russian uh, television. Uh, could you please say something about that? Yeah, so I want to come back very briefly to this notion of unsettled times, um, in part because it helps to frame the discussion. Um, so. Typically, when we talk about banal nationalism, everyday nationalism, the kinds of ordinary nationalism that happens in the background, we're talking about times that people consider to be settled, um, when, every, when there isn't a great deal of uncertainty about whether or not, say, basic, fundamental, social, or political institutions will survive. COVID was one of those moments when, at least in the initial phases, there was a great deal of uncertainty about what would happen uh, with institutions, and this was worldwide in which the, the prominent demand that you heard from people was, you know, when will things get back to normal? Everyday nationalism in unsettled times is really a, this radical assertion of normality, this, this demand to return to normality. And so you see this, for instance, in Ukraine, um, and Marnie Hallett, for instance, has written about everyday nationalism in Ukrainian bomb shelters as a way of trying to sort of recreate normality even in the midst of bombardment um, um, underground within, in, in Ukraine. In Russia, it's a little bit different. Uh, Russia moved very smoothly from COVID to full-scale invasion. There was no break in between, really. And so in that sense, Russia has had an unbroken period of unsettled times, really starting from, uh, from 2020 going forward. But unlike Ukraine, in Russia, national expression is very closely monitored and patrolled by 
the Kremlin. Um, and that means that national expression oftentimes is something which can be politically dangerous. And therefore, there's not a lot of dissent related to national expression, at least not that which reaches sort of into public channels. The problem is that official nationalism or patriotism is not particularly interesting. People don't usually associate, get you know very inspired by it. And so oftentimes, what we see in Russian propaganda is that the regime will reach into people's everyday lives and draw out examples of what that is in order to be able to portray how the regime responds to what they consider to be normal. Okay, with that backstory, if we look at what's happening in the occupied territories of Ukraine, um, the way that they are depicted in Russian, on Russian broadcast media and television, radio, what have you, they are depicted as returning to normal. And so what you see are images of Russia rebuilding the territories. There's no mention that Russia destroyed the territories to begin with, right? But there are mentions that Russia is rebuilding, um, they're developing, they're implementing national celebrations, uh, children are going to school and learning good Russian things. And in this sense, the occupied ter territories are being brought to normality by being brought to Russia. And this way, it's not really about a demand to return to normality. Instead, Russia is simply redefining normality as itself. And this is what the day-to-day -day life then in occupied territories is portrayed for ordinary Russians who watch television, for instance, in the country. I like that you're saying this, that they are redefining normality, because I find that uh, to be descriptive for the Ukrainian case as well. Uh, just as one example, the, the pressure now also from below to rename streets mm. in Ukraine. I mean, there's this uh, heritage, Soviet heritage of enormous amounts of street uh, holding, you know, Soviet names, names of uh, of Russia's, Russian cities. Uh, uh, and they want to sort of, they want the new normality, uh, a Ukrainian normality uh, um, that uh, uh, sort of stresses their sovereignty uh, as, a, as a Ukrainian state. Uh, uh. Yeah, and the fact that that is pressure that comes from below, I think, is really crucial in distinguishing between the cases. Right, because what you're seeing is that the war, and already and we're talking about the war starting in 2014 going forward, right, um, really incentivized this social and societal interest into everyday expressions of Ukrainian identity. It's not just something that's, you know, foisted upon the population from above. There's a wellspring of civil society, economic society interest in the nation, defining it, you know, uh, uh, not only in terms of public space, uh, but also in terms, say, for instance, brands, um, national branding. Um, or in terms of everyday practices, uh, like you know the, the kinds of things you put on display in your house, especially when guests come around, right? In Russia, you don't have the same kind of incentivization of everyday life and, and uh, everyday nationality in Russia. Instead, this is something which is very much uh, monopolized by the regime. Um, and that makes it then something which is not a routine matter of concern. It's just the opposite. So you know, in Ukraine, people become have come to routinely uh, care about Ukrainian identity in their everyday life. And in Russia, people have largely ceased to care about the imposition of national patriotic symbols in their day-to-day -day lives. Okay, uh, so, but uh, after the, the full-scale invasion uh, in 22, they started using those symbols of Z and V. Uh, uh, they tried to impose those uh, symbols on the people. And what you're saying is that that hasn't really worked. So people don't react positively to those symbols. Mm -hmm. So it, the question is, what do you mean by it hasn't worked? As in... People are not caring. People I don't guess. care yeah. about the imposition of the symbols. So they will buy the, buy, they'll buy the jackets that have the Zs on them, right? Um, they will be marched out to, you know, school kids will be marched out to form Zs, you know, publicly on, photo, on display. Uh, but these are performances that are stage managed for the most part. Um, most people don't feel like they have any efficacy with regards to the war or to the symbols. And so it's not a matter of concern for them. And so in that sense, they have ceased to care about the routine imposition of these symbols in their day-to-day -day lives. There are, of course, a few people that are very sort of, they, you know, in Russian, they're referred to as ra patrioti, mm -hmm. right? But that's not representative necessarily of the population. Uh, there's always going to be a small portion of the population that's mobilized in any given nation. Uh, what we're talking about is the vast majority of people in their everyday lives. 
So uh, going back to the introduction uh, to this podcast today, I just mentioned images from Kherson uh, about uh, about how they uh, are baking some cookies for Russia Day, and and this was mentioned very uh, briefly uh, in in a news uh, report uh, that mostly focused on Moscow actually, but they were like he has he's a story from Novgorod, here's Beretia, and here is Kherson. And then they moved on, right? And so my impression is that uh, part of the normalization process is just mention these regions as part uh, as part of Russia, and repeating that. Is that uh, what you also think? Yeah, I think that's a process of creating sort of uh, a, a perception of occupied regions just as a normal part of Russia. Um, and so the idea is to mention them in the same breath with other regions that are participating in the same national ce celebrations or rituals. And you see this actually a lot um, in the ways that the, uh, so the occupied regions of Russian television are characterized as new regions. Uh, that's the, the epithet that's used. And usually when they are mentioned in conjunction with say a national celebration or a holiday, what's actually happening individually in those occupied regions is not really discussed. Instead, they are mentioned in passing. So like, you know, also it, this happened in Donbass or this also happened in, in uh, uh, Kherson or what have you. Um, and so in this way, it's flagging for viewers the fact that these parts of Ukraine are now part of Russia as far as they're concerned. Um, and in that sense, it's not important that they are distinctive, just the opposite. They're supposed to be perceived as being the same part, same as any other region in Russia in that context. Have you noticed any differences in how Crimea is mentioned? For instance, is has that been normalized that Crimea is a part of Russia? Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, the, this term "new regions" used to be originally used with uh, reference to Crimea and Sevastopol back in uh, 2014, and it has since basically fallen out of usage in relationship to Crimea. Um, which is now treated as incontrovertibly part of Russia. Um, and the only time that is mentioned in relationship with Crimea is just on the anniversary of the annexation of Crimea by Russia. Um, but since then, it has it's fallen out of disuse. It was essentially brought into use again with, re with regard to the four occupied territories um, in the current conflict. So, okay, while well, this is going on in Ukraine, the incentivization uh, of uh, choosing Ukrainian uh, nationalist uh, practices and uh, Ukrainian language. Uh, on, uh, on the Russian side, um, the war is getting less and less mentioned on the television and people are, are detaching uh, themselves uh, from it uh, in order to to get back uh, to the normality? Yeah, so the, I should preface this by saying that the information that we have about public opinion, about people's attitudes and orientations towards the war are limited, of course, by the conditions under which you know, the data is gathered. So surveys, on the one hand, you, still, you can still conduct surveys, but on the other, there's a lot of doubts about whether or not they're actually reliable. Um, and so we have a lot of data also about the content of the, of the news, the sorts of things that Russian propaganda conveys to ordinary Russians in their everyday life. We don't necessarily know how effective it is. Um, so I feel obligated as a social scientist to make that caveat, right? But what we have seen is that the mentions of the war steadily diminished throughout the first year um, and since then have kind of settled into a, a dull roar in the background. And it centers around a few basic themes. So we see lots of mentions, for instance, of Russia's enemies. And those enemies are usually, more often than not, they're defined as the United States and as Ukrainian nationalists. You don't see a lot of mentions of Nazis. You don't see a lot of mentions of you know, uh, either Putin's justifications for war, of denazifying or demilitarizing Ukraine. Those have basically fallen off the map. Um, you don't see really any mention of what the U.S. or Ukrainian nationalists are purportedly trying to do. So the enemy is shorn of logic. Instead, you have an enemy image backed up with repeated mentions of the special military operation, which is something important that Russia apparently needs to do. And then also the legitimating principles of liberation and patriotism. Um, 
uh, legitimate uh, liberation in the sense of liberating either you know territories of Ukraine from Ukrainian control or liberating people from Ukrainian uh, government, um, or even liberating people from Ukrainian nationality, as the case may be. Even in a broader sense, Russia presents the war in Ukraine as a war of international decolonization, right? fighting against American imperialism. And so liberation is something that's thrown out a lot as justification for what Russia is doing without really explaining what Russia's enemies are actually doing anyway. Um, and then patriotism, in the sense that people have an obligation to support the state to support the special military operation, even if you don't actually know what it is that Russia is actually doing in the midst of it, and even if the television doesn't really explain what Russia is actually doing in the course of things. So, yes, we have this message that's conveyed to a Russian public that presents a special military operation that against Russia's implacable foes that's demanded by abstract concepts of patriotism and liberation. And not surprisingly, most people turn their backs on it. They disengage. Um, and so the important thing for state propaganda is to keep this sort of on the back burner and not to get too much into people's faces with it. Uh, and so that ordinary, normal, everyday life in Russia is not disrupted by the war. Then I wonder, because there has been some incidents where the war has actually come to Russia, and mm -hmm. uh, especially in the closest regions to, to Ukraine, Belgorod, uh, the city has, uh, uh, there has been uh, incidents of uh, people actually dying um, because uh, of counter attacks from, from the Ukrainian uh, side. Uh, Mm. How do you uh, sort of see that in this um, uh, attempt to, to normalize? Or is it ignored in the Russian broadcasting? Or how do they uh, deal with it? So it's not ignored, uh, but it is carefully managed. And so far as, you know, we think about, for instance, last summer, there were attacks on Belgorod uh, that included also attacks on Russian territory by Russian partisans. Uh, that were that launched an attack from you know the Ukrainian side, um, and the television reporting. Those attacks were reported simply as artillery shelling. There was no mention of the of the Russian partisans that were fighting on Ukraine's side. Um, there was a denial that anything actually happened on Ukraine's side, and they even gave a medal to the mayor of Belgorod for defense of the area, just sort of reinforce the idea that there was never really any real threat. Um, so there's a lot of doubling down in the propaganda where it's depicted that, you know, Ukraine is trying to attack us, is trying to attack ordinary Russians, um, but inevitably they will fail because, you know, Ukraine's fatally flawed as an enemy, Russia will prevail, and we know this is happening because, see, we gave a medal to the mayor. Um, we saw a similar thing happening, for instance, with the destruction of the uh, hydroelectric dam, uh, Novaya Kohovka. Um, also, that was very quickly blamed. Uh, well, initially it was blamed on the West and then was blamed on Ukrainian nationalists. Um, and this sort of thing continues, then the, the ecological damage, the catastrophe falling out from the attack on the dam could easily be blamed on the Ukrainian side. So these sorts of things can be discussed in the media, but there is a very clear playbook for how they're uh, discussed on Russian television. So to sum up our conversation, uh, the war has become a background noise in Russia and that is maintained by a heavy, heavy dose of daily propaganda. Uh, but the war has had a consolidating effect on the Ukrainian population so far, and everyday nationalist practices are thriving. We will end on that note. Thank you to Paul Good and Marte Handomyre. My name is Natalia Moon Larsen, and you just heard an episode of the World Stage from Nupi. Mm -hmm.